Hello and welcome to APAC Games Weekly episode 49. I am Connell Souter and on APAC Games Weekly we take you through the biggest games headlines of the past week from across the games industries of the APAC region. Today we've got a couple less stories than usual, it's not been a hugely busy week. We'll be starting with multiple stories about Palworld, then to imported game approvals for China, a little bit different to usual, Indonesia changing their rules for game publishers and more. So to kick off episode 49, let's cover those stories that I mentioned about Palworld. Japanese celebrities are reportedly being told not to mention Palworld to avoid Pokemon backlash. Now, in our first story, according to Tokyo Sports, which is a magazine based in Japan, who are citing a talent agency that they've spoken to, they're saying that celebrities are being told to avoid mentioning Pal World and any interest in playing it purely to avoid upsetting the Pokemon company. The source told Tokyo Sports, quote, we have told our talent not to mention Pal World on social media or in public. This was done out of consideration for the Pokemon side as an agency. This decision was made in consideration of future potential collaborations. End quote. So just to be clear, this isn't Nintendo or any other company telling agencies not to mention Pal World. From the quote, it's simply that they are avoiding it out of fear that it would cause issues with working with the Pokemon brand in the future. But of course, that is still interesting. It, these are not conflicting, right? Pal World at its core, while similar, is its own IP. So it is interesting to think of people being told to avoid talking about a game because it has similar concepts to another um, intellectual property. A very interesting problem. Uh, obviously, this is Japan, and in a wider sense, and very much so in terms of the Japanese industry, there is a bit of a golden rule, which is don't annoy Nintendo, as I'm sure you've heard about countless ROM hackers doing over the last 20 or more years. Uh, according to numbers from Microsoft, with relation to Pal World, it is the biggest third-party Game Pass launch to date. Sorry, a bit of a wordy one that, but yeah, the biggest third-party Game Pass launch, which is pretty crazy. And supposedly, the Xbox version peaked at around 3 million daily active users. And again, it's only been out for, what, three weeks at this point? Absolutely bonkers. So, of course, this is an interesting continuation overall from the story about last week with the Pokemon Company statement. Uh, we'll keep you up to date on any movements on this. I don't know how much we'll see officially or if it's going to be a lot of a bit of the they said, they said when it comes to these things. All we can hope for is that the game manages to stay active, everyone's happy at the end, and players don't have to stop playing a the game they love. Pal World sparks cloud service race between Alibaba and Tencent in China. So this is a bit of a short follow-up to the previous story. It's not quite as meaty as, as most on the show, but um, this is a very interesting one to think of the knock-on effects of one game's success. So Pal World obviously has done very, very well, and it did much, much better than the developer thought. While they probably expected a fairly successful launch, I don't think they expected millions and millions and millions of players. Because of that, Pocket Bear, who are the developer of the game, probably didn't have the structural integrity set up already for this number of players, so what they've had to do is move to private server hosting. They're, by allowing that, they let people do it themselves, they can have their own little space where they don't have to worry about other players, and also it alleviates a lot of the difficulties on Pocket Pair to manage that. Um, as any of us who play online games know, when games do have dedicated servers, it requires a huge amount of management on the development team or publisher, depending on who's doing it, usually someone at the developer. Um, whereas if you allow private servers, as long as you build a strong structural basis for installing on the server that doesn't have many issues, I think it probably ends up with a lot less headaches for you and your team along the line. As you might imagine, 
these custom servers that they're now allowing are going straight to the giants of Alibaba and Tencent, among others, but of course these two are snatching up a lot of players as they're able to offer fantastic rates and deals because of their size. They're somewhat scrabbling against each other to grab as many players as possible. You can tell that by the costs are essentially matching each other across both of those companies, which isn't something new. They often have done that in the past when games have allowed private servers. You see both of these companies kind of duking it out with similar costs. Uh, and likely at this point, the performance of these servers is also going to be pretty similar. So it really probably comes down to maybe you get a good offer somewhere or you just like one of these companies more than the other. It's likely not to be the last time that these companies are in an arms race, but it'll certainly be interesting to see just if one of them comes out as a bit of the victor for PAL World becoming the sort of unofficial official server host. We'll have to see and we'll keep up to date with it. China's Games Regulator approves Dungeon and Fighter Mobile among 32 imported titles, giving a boost to Tencent among others. So, in a slightly different news to the usual this month, there's actually been 30 new foreign titles approved in China. Of course, these are still going to be managed in the market by local publishers, but they have originally came from overseas companies. The list includes a reportedly hit title, Dungeon and Fighter, brackets DNF, uh, mobile. I can't say that I've ever heard of it, but apparently it's very successful. Um, that will be operated by Tencent in the region. Uh, these approvals also were kind of unexpected. Uh, people thought there was a good boost, obviously, in January that we talked about last week. But this was not set to be another batch so soon. Um, what's likely the reason for that is those difficulties because of the suggested regulations at the start of the year. They're still rectifying the hit that that had on company values. So this is, is definitely a mark of um, trying to recoup more um, interest and excitement about the, the market. As usual, we won't go through the full list of games as I don't want to bore you, but it does include lots of games that you would kind of expect, a few that you don't, and all these are going to be run, as I say, by the companies that you typically do when they go into the Chinese market. And for our final story of the day, Indonesia plans to reset rules for Nintendo and other games publishers. So you might remember from sometime last year, I'll be honest and say this is one of the few times when I have literally no idea when we talked about that. I know we did, but I don't know at what point in the year it was at all. But there was new news announced that Indonesia was introducing rules for games companies for publishing them in the kingdom and needing to get approval before their release. So this can definitely be seen as a continuation of that. We haven't seen any updates on it since then, whenever it was. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty interesting one. Uh, so this is now getting a lot closer to movement and actual implementation, although we'll go into that a little bit later in the story about why that's... <laughs> it's hard to say quite how close it is, but anyway. Um, this is going to affect every games publisher, it seems, in Indonesia, uh, with many of them being specifically called out in coverage. I'm not sure quite why they had to name specific names, but maybe it's to get people reading the articles, I'm not sure. These new rules will demand that all games publishers must have a legal entity within Indonesia. Uh, it's likely that this is so that they can tax those companies domestically and ensure that some of the money from the Indonesian games industry is not just immediately flowing out to American companies and things like this. An understandable thrust, but certainly a bit of a strange one, and we'll talk a little bit more about why it's strange at the end. Samuel Abrajani Pangarapan, who is the Director for Informatic Apps at the Communications and Information Technology Ministry of Indonesia, was asked about this and said, quote, If they are not registered here, if the publishers do not have a legal entity here, the games on that platform will be blocked. We want to build the digital economy. We don't want to be just spectators. Let's build it together. End quote. So one point to raise here, and it's what I was saying about a little bit of a funny discussion going on in terms of the companies being called out, is all of the articles about this and everything that the Indonesian government says uses the word publishers. But when you actually look into what they're talking about, 
They're talking about platform holders. They're not talking about publishers at all. So while you'll notice it, if you read any of the articles on this, that there's a kind of weird mix of companies being named. They'll mention ones who are purely kind of game publishers, and then they'll throw in like Valve. And you're like, well, what's going on? Obviously, it's because Steam officially supports Indonesian. They're very aware of Valve and Steam. So there, a lot of these articles are talking about that. Whereas they also will mention like just random games company like Riot and you're like, cool, but Riot don't publish a platform. Anyway, it's a bit of a strange one, certainly. Uh, what's also funny about this is that they go on to ask him about the other regulations uh, about and a new rating agency being possible. Um, and Samuel responds to that with, quote, this should be completed soon. My target is before the end of this month. End quote, which feels like an oddly like in office kind of answer to that question. <laughs> it's like a little bit honest to be like, oh yeah, uh, I'll get you it on this day. I'll get you it next Monday. It's like this guy's a journalist, you know. But anyway, it's it's a bit of an interesting story and a bit of a funny one. And um, I imagine this is a little bit of a reaction from the local government to the success that Indonesian as a language has in games. As I say, uh, being officially supported on Steam as well as being kind of a major growing language in mobile. It does though come across that they don't maybe have the deepest understanding perhaps of some of where the games industry is. Whether this confusion is purely from the media covering it or it does stem from the original government's discussion of it. Of course, most of the things we're reading are translated anyway. But yeah, it's a bit of a funny one, quite a weird one. It does seem that it affects storeholders as opposed to publishers, but we'll really have to see quite how this goes. And that was our final story for APAC Games Weekly episode 49. Thank you so much as always for joining us and I hope you found these stories interesting. Please come back next week for episode 50 next Monday, same time, same place. But until then, I hope you have a great week.